Hey there guys, welcome back for another lecture. This is your your favorite backyard geographer and geologist uh, giving another presentation, this time on metamorphic rocks. The purpose of this video is to introduce you to what metamorphism is, uh, the different types of structures, we'll talk about contact versus regional metamorphism, and just kind of get you underway to be able to start seeing what are the physical uh, properties that are present in metamorphic rocks that allow you to identify them in the field. So let's get going. All right, so metamorphic rocks. So what is that? Well, when rocks are baked by the heat of molten magma or squeezed by the movements of tectonics or the overlying succession of rocks, those rocks will be altered or changed beyond their original recognition. Metamorphism is the really like a butterfly. You go from a caterpillar and it gets into a cocoon, it metamorphose into a butterfly, right? Metamorphism can take any mineral or rock, so any igneous, sedimentary, or even metamorphic rock, and change it again. Changes will be seen in the chemical composition, texture, and structure. And why does that happen? Because you have the same ingredients but you're applying either heat and or pressure, which can actually rearrange some of that chemical composition. So it will then read differently. It's kind of like um, if you've ever done any baking, you when you go, if you want to be a professional baker, it's a science, it's chemistry. You, know, you have to do the powder, the dry first, and mix with your wet. But if you change the order, even though it's the same ingredients, but if you rearrange your order, you can get a completely different thing. Lastly, high temperature, high pressure, and chemically active fluids are all things that will be involved within this. I love the photo I shared here right in the middle, right down here, because we can see a, a beautiful anticline and syncline, so anticline being the A form, syncline being the other fold. Um, but you know, knowing that there has been a change to this rock, and then if we were to even dissect it further, we'd see that it is metamorphic rock within. Uh, we can we talk about that later uh, when looking at foliation. So contact versus regional, two different things. So contact metamorphism occurs under higher temperature conditions and they're often associated with igneous intrusions on a much smaller scale. So it's like a, like a point, like a point of contact. Uh, the high temperatures will bake the surrounding country rock as the magma intrudes into this country rock with a metamorphic um, formation. Um, the formed rocks are usually called the hornfells so contact metamorphism, I mean, and I know that I'd say it's a point of contact, it can be very large. You think of like a volcano. Um, so it's very large areas, but it's done predominantly on or around igneous rock. Then we move uh, forward. Uh, regional metamorphism occurs as a result of converging tectonic activity and is usually characterized by very low temperatures, but high pressure. These conditions exist um, perhaps on, um, Subduction zones, so the, you know, again, regional is huge regions that are affected by this much larger, uh, slower, in a sense, uh, not as hot, but grand uh, pressure that's being built up. Uh, thus, this type of metamorphism is uh, often associated with uh, orogenic events, so like an orogeny, and over a large area, uh, and, oh, sorry, and over large areas will cause greater metamorphism. So we have additional pressure and weight that's being pushed either from the side or all around. All right, so what are some of the attributes or um, elements essentially behind metamorphisms? The first one is temperature. So the source of the temperature is either from magma itself or is this due to the depth factor that as you have things that are buried, you're going to have heat from around there as well, but you're also going to have just pressure. And as the pressure is pushing down, pressure creates heat. More metamorphism can change the mineral composition and texture of these rocks that are subjected to temperature. So we have either low grade or high grade. So low grade is between 100 to 500 degrees Celsius. High grade is 500 degrees Celsius and beyond. The diagram that I decided to share on this slide is, <clears throat> excuse me, showing um, depth. So depth is going down the the table itself, going down, and then we have an increase of temperatures. So what's well, I don't know, what was kind of neat about this diagram is it's showing that because of um, 
you transitioning from low to high grade and for depth is that those are the type of rocks that are most likely going to be found within that environment. So you can see that, you know, we have slate at the top, phyllite, schist, nice, um, and migmatite, you know, and then we can see uh, other grain sizes, necklogite, things like that. But um, it's... It's interesting when you think about metamorphic rocks because metamorphic rocks can be re-metamorphosed or they can continue to change. So yes, you can make a metamorphic rock and then you can introduce it to additional heat and then it can change yet again. So it's, just, it's a very interesting process that it's kind of like, um, like you're recycling and turning something new. You, know, you made, you have bread, but then you decide to turn that bread into bread pudding, and then you're gonna recook that bread pudding again to make it something else. And you just kind of keep stacking and changing, essentially the chemistry and then the visual aspect of what that rock will look like. Pressure, under pressure. So this is another one that we can look at. So we have two types that we're gonna be able to observe in this diagram. You have uniform pressure and direct or differential. So uniform. It, well, when you think of uniform, it's kind of like, um, well, like atmospheric pressure. It's uniform for us, that we have pressure pushing from above, but from all different areas. So when you think about atmospheric pressure on the average human, it's about the weight of an elephant or four tons of atmospheric pressure pushing down on you. But it's not just on your shoulders. It's all around. It's uniform. So it, it, ha it helps um, essentially balance that. So it says increases with depth during to overburden, acts vertically downwards and affects the volume and of liquids and solids. High temperature is also included as a depth factor and lithostatic pressure due to that overburden. So uniform pressure is being pushed all the way around and then as it pushes down you can then you know um, apply additional pressure thereafter. Now direct or differential is a little bit different. It also increase, increases with depth to a certain extent, um, acts in all directions and affects only solids, resulting into deformational shapes and changes in that mineral composition. Um, high temperature is not always associated with depth when looking at direct or differential pressure, and stress due to tectonic forces will add to it. So the diagram on the left is showing the both. You have uniform stress versus differential. So it's differential is different in different spots. So we have here in uniform these, you know, very similar in size, grain size crystals that are um, mineral compound, it's probably a piece of granite. But on the right is showing differential stress and notice that because it's being pre pressed more on the side, it's allowing for those minerals to reband and to become parallel to one another um, and in a linear line and will create this type of banding, which we would acknowledge as being a nice, G-N-E-I-S-S, -S, which is a type of metamorphic rock. So that's an example of pressure. Other structures, which I kind of alluded to already, we have foliation, lineation, and then we'll also look at um, non-foliation in, in a moment. So foliation, so that is when platy, uh, lamellar, or flaky minerals, such as silicates, micas, um, you know, micas being your biotite or muscovite, chlorite, talc, um, that are occurring in the rock reorient themselves parallel to one another. So you end up creating these bands. So notice that the diagram on the left is showing all these different crystals that were intergrown, but then now you're applying um, the metamorphic process and it's gonna force these minerals to and kind of realign in a uh, linear fashion. Uh, so you have before versus after. Uh, lineation is when prismatic or rod-like minerals, such as maybe a hornblende or a tourmaline, does the, they do the exact same thing. So the, the, really the bigger picture is that the idea of foliation or lineation is when you have uh, enough pressure that allows the minerals that were present and the appropriate minerals, ones that are flaky or platy already in their structure, to realign themselves. So you're rearranging the, the really the um, the mineralogy within that rock. So, um, oh, you're right. See, okay, you're right. That's going to be non-foliation. But I want to talk about um, uh, schisto structure and uh, Nisic. So, because of this idea of pressure and heat in metamorphic um, environments, we can have other types of structures that we can look at as well. 
So the schistose uh, is usually formed during intermediate and high grade metamorphism. The grain size will increase and can be seen by the naked eye. The grains tend to be enlarged with increasing grade of metamorphism. The coarse grained sheet structure minerals will show preferred orientation. So notice in the diagram, we can see that there is a preferred orientation pattern. A grain size is the main difference between slaty structures and schistose structures. Um, schistose, uh, as we'll see later, schist is a type of metamorphic rock as well. Um, and that's where it gets its, its name from. So Nysic, Nice, which is another rock, is a structure usually associated with high grade regional metamorphism where differential stress will prevail the tectonic forces. Um, where the sheet silicates and other minerals such as quartz, feldspar, horn, um, hornblende, pyroxene are segregated into distinct bands within the rock known as Nysic banding. So you still will get um, a type of foliation, but it's done differently. Um, I would also say that my experience between the two uh, schistose environments and Nysic, uh, I find that schistose is easier for me to it appears to be more metallic-y in its luster, usually with more of a glitter involvement, like when you're looking at it. It also looks more um, platey where I can peel it, versus Nysic seems to be more reintergrown, um, where the, it, it's not gonna come apart. It's not platey, it's not sheety in any type. It's really held together well. So I already mentioned this kind of before, but non-foliated. So non-foliation can also occur in the metamorphic process. So that non-foliated metamorphic rock will lack the foliation structure because they often lack the material or the minerals, such as micas, that would be needed or would be able to create that foliated um, line. They commonly result from contact or regional metamorphism, and examples include your marbles, quartzite, greenstone, maybe even a hornfell and anthracite. So what's neat about this is that when we look at non-foliated metamorphic rocks, is that, you know, it's always, what was it before and what is it now? Is that with non-foliated, uh, it really creates a uniform piece. So like as an example, I just, I mean, I know it's, it's a photo, so I, I could be wrong, but I'm gonna, I'm pretty confident in thinking that this is probably going um, to be a quartzite. So uh, quartzite, uh, to me, always looks like like old chewed up bubble gum. I don't know, it's a weird thing, but uh, quartzite. What was quartzite? Quartzite was at one point sandstone, but it was metamorphosed and it re bonded essentially reformed into a new rock known as quartzite um, marble uh, marble was once a limestone um, anthracite was once a coal uh, coal which is a sedimentary rock can be re, uh, re metamorphosed into an anthracite which we know is known as hard coal um, anthracite anthracite's really pretty it has it's black in, in color just like coal but it has a gold hue and it was, it's part of the um, chemical change in that process. So non-foliation. So, um, you know, foliated rocks, it makes it very easy when you see a foliated rock uh, when you're uh, looking in the field because you can see the banding in it. it makes it pretty easy. Uh, non-foliated people, it's hard. It's hard to tell the difference between a non-foliated metamorphic rock and certain minerals. But, you know, over time and over certain tools, uh, you'll be able to kind of figure that out. Uh, moving forward, though. I thought this was interesting. It's a, the diagram on your left shows foliated and non-foliated rocks. Gives you some characteristics: what it was, the prolith, so what it a uh, protolith, what it used to be, and then what it is now after metamorphism. And then this other one next to it is showing what happens to a certain rock if you were to able to increase. So um, going this way, sorry, it's backwards on the screen. <laughs> going this way, going from a shale down to a gneiss. So things to point out, non-foliated rocks, we can see that we've got quartzite, marble, hornsville, anthracite, explains what it used to be. Foliated, same thing. But this one's showing the way that they're in order for, for foliated is going from the bottom to the top. Going from bottom to top, top is going to have the more increased pressure and temperature. So we can see how we go from a slate, which used to be a shale um, that's been Metamorphose very fine grain, tends to split in parallel fragments. You metamorph you add more heat and pressure, it would transition into a fine grain rock known as a phyllite. 
you can do it again, which will then turn into a, um, into a schist. A schist is, um, sometimes again, that's even when you start to be able to develop garnets. Like as an example, the Vishnu schist. The Vishnu schist is one of the oldest rocks at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And they were able to use the garnets to do carbon dating to see how old that material was. Um, and then lastly, you have your nice, which has got really nice banding to it as well. Um, so that being said, I was looking at my um, uh, my little box of, of stuff here, and I was a little disappointed. Oh, my box. You can't see what I'm looking at. You know, remember this again? I was talking about these in my other videos. Um, I was looking at it, and I was really kind of disappointed. There's really not a lot in here um, that is metamorphic. So I've got, you know, your classic piece of white marble. Um, I know it has like a, like a band in it, but it's not uh, foliated. It's non-foliated. You can see the crystals that were in there. This used to be a limestone, so if I dropped hydrochloric acid of about 10%, um, that would sizzle. Um, and let's see here. I also saw in here, yeah, I do have a piece of, um, of like a gray slate. My great-grandma her, she lived up by Yosemite. They had a lot of slate up there. She would use big pieces of this uh, to create like uh, walkways in her patio. But it, you can actually see some lining in it, some banding, um, some, some um, foliation, I guess, in a sense. But um, it's pretty pretty hard because uh, remember, it used to be a shale, but it was metamorphosed. And I think that might be one of the only two that are in here. I'm just going to double check. Ba -ba 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 yeah, it's kind of depressing. It's a big old box. You only get um, and you only get two, two different uh, metamorphic rocks. Kind of a bummer, but um, but you know that's what can you do about it. So here we move on to our last slide here for your uh, flowchart: metamorphic rocks. What are metamorphic rocks? Material that are changed as the result of intense heat or pressure, and we can go in one or two different ways. It can either be contact, uh, metamorphism, you have regional metamorphism. They both involve heat and pressure, but contact has more heat, regional has more pressure. Um, and that's what really separates those two uh, within their boundaries themselves. All right. Well, I hope that was a good crash course in uh, metamorphic rocks. And it's you know it's a little more complicated than just saying what did it used to be. Is that there's different things we can look at with the structure, the pressure, uh, what type of uh, metamorphism was involved, and so on and so forth. Uh, so don't forget to click like and subscribe. And uh, the last thing I'll add here before you head out is um, check out Dichotomous Keys. I think that's really really a great resource. This is a Dichotomous Key that I use often in my classes on how to identify rock families because I think it can be very challenging to differentiate you know igneous sedimentary metamorphic and I think that this is a great thing if you have a chance take a screenshot of this of this dichotomous key I think this works pretty well it works pretty well I'd give it like a 93% you know it's it, it's still a piece of paper right but I think that by asking yourself certain questions about you know is the rock are the crystals intergrown Meaning, did they form at the same time versus was it glued together or lithified? Or do we see that the rock itself is able to split because it has foliation or does it have any type of distinct banding that was caused by pressure? Those things, I think, help you learn to identify um, your specimens much easier. But anyway, I hope that's helpful. I think this dichotomous key that you see right here can be very helpful in, in trying to distinguish at least the rock family. Uh, that being said, thanks for your time, and we will talk soon.